Dr. Kasturi Ranganji. So many of my uh, inspirations are on stage here. It feels very weird to be standing here. Uh, but Dr. Kasturi Ranganji, Chancellor Dr. Sridharji, uh, Vice Chancellor Professor Dongreji, Pro Chancellor Sri Kumarji, uh, guests of honor, Minister of Higher Education Sri Ashwat Naranji, uh, my mom in Bangalore, Dr. Sadamurti ji, <laughs> and of course Dr. Sitaram Jindal ji, and all the incredible members of the board. What an amazing group of people guiding this university, members of the board, advisory board, faculty, staff, and students of Chanakya University, and of course the incredible distinguished members of the audience. Uh, thank you so much. It's, it's wonderful to be, very exciting to be back in Bangalore. Uh, the last time I was here, about two, three years ago, uh, I remember I stayed here for about one year, uh, working very hard on writing and helping pass the national education policy under the great leadership of Dr. Kasturi Ranganji. And it's just a joy to see that it was passed and now it's starting to be implemented here. So many of the members of the, of the team that worked with Dr. Kasturi Ranganji are of course here. Thank you so much to all of you who, um, who contributed to that and for coming here today. So it's kind of going full circle, coming back uh, to Bangalore after these couple of years uh, to a university that's being launched that is committing to be the first, first university to be committing to implementing the national education policy in letter and spirit as it launches. Amazing. So that is a, that's a really exciting moment. I hope many universities will, will follow um, with the, in this example. So just in brief, the national education policy worked very hard. Uh, we worked very hard to find the global best practices for what higher education should be. And in brief, that means that a higher education should be multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary. It should emphasize critical and analytical thinking so that students who are learning these multiple disciplines can see the connections between the disciplines and use those connections for their own innovations or thinking out of the box and to create uh, new knowledge. And being multidisciplinary and having that analytical thinking ability is the best way of, of innovating and the best way of moving uh, the country forward. Uh, so the goal is to move away from the single stream institutions that had become prevalent during colonial India and then even after, uh, where students were just learning one stream uh, and only working in that one area, and so not being able to make those connections that are really needed across disciplines to make real progress. So this is, a, this is the thrust of the national education policy, and it's, and it's wonderful city to see Janaka University moving forward with this, um, with this vision. Some of the best universities in the world have used this vision in the past. Nalanda University is, in India's great past, an example of how multidisciplinary education produced some of the most incredible knowledge uh, ever seen uh, in the history of humanity. And now in modern times, uh, for example, the Ivy Leagues in the United States use this example of multidisciplinary, holistic, liberal education to really produce some of the most innovative and successful individuals in innovation and entrepreneurship and research. So that example is one that really needs to be brought back to India. India used to have it um, in universities such as Nalanda University. It's time to bring it back because that's really what's needed for, uh, for India's future, for the, for the global future, uh, for students to have that 21st century skills of communication, of critical analysis, of uh, multidisciplinary education. So I just want to give you one example from my own field of how multidisciplinary thinking and multidisciplinary education uh, really move forward human progress. I want to tell you a little story about one of the greatest inventions that humanity has ever produced. Uh, often one says, oh, the wheel uh, is one, of, one such invention. Uh, but there's another invention that kind of looks like the wheel and is one of the greatest inventions that we sometimes don't appreciate, but it kind of looks like the wheel. You know what I'm talking about? The zero. So the zero is actually one of those inventions that has really propelled humanity forward. And it's something we now take for granted. 
But what is the history of the zero? How did it come about? And how did it come into the numerals that we now use today that is now the basis for all computers and cell phones and all technology? How did that come to be? Uh, many Indians often wear this t-shirt. Lots of young Indians wear this t-shirt that says, India, India's contribution to mathematics is zero. <laughs> And there's sometimes a subtitle on that t-shirt that says, we always knew we were good for nothing. So lots of Indians are aware that uh, zero is India's contribution, and that's a very important one. But most of the public is not aware of what exactly that means. What does that mean that India contributed zero, and what does it mean uh, that it's an important discovery? And how exactly did it happen in India? I want to tell you a little bit about that story. Uh, because it's quite incredible, and I think it really shows the power of multidisciplinary thinking. It also shows the power of understanding ancient Indian knowledge, just ancient Indian knowledge, understanding history of how knowledge came about. Uh, and it's a nice story because it did actually happen in India before it spread throughout the world. So how did zero, how did the concept of zero start? It actually started in ancient Indian philosophy. The first place where we see the notion of zero is in ancient Indian philosophy. Uh, when the ancient texts, the Upanishads, and a lot of ancient Buddhist texts talked about the power of meditation. What was the goal of meditation? The goal of meditation was to achieve the state of shunyata, zeroness. The goal was to empty the mind of emotions, of feelings, of ego, of thoughts, uh, so that one attained a certain uh, mind-body connection. That was the goal of meditation. And that's where the word shunya was originally first used. Shunyata, the state of zeroness, what we're trying to achieve in meditation. And that goes back thousands of years. And that's where the notion of zero first really comes up uh, in world literature. So there's sort of landmarks in the development of zero. First was the concept of zero, which came in ancient Indian philosophy, as I said, uh, achieving zeroness through meditation. And the next big landmark was then taking that concept of zero and writing it as a symbol so that we have a symbol of zero. And the first place that the symbol of zero was written down was actually in works in linguistics. So Parnini, who wrote one of the greatest grammatical works uh, in history that really laid the foundations for modern uh, linguistics, Parnini wrote down a symbol for the empty syllable, a syllable where you don't say anything. And Parnini considered that equal to any other letter, but it was just the void, emptiness. And Parnini had a symbol for that called Avagraha. It looks like an S called the Lopa. And in Parnini's sutras, there are actually rules for manipulating syllables, including the empty syllable, which had its own symbol called the Lopa, or the Avagraha. And so that was the first zero. It was a linguistic zero, a zero of speech, a zero of uh, language. And that's the first time that the zero came up as a written symbol, and it came up in linguistics. And from linguistics, it moved on to poetry. When poets wrote poetry, if they needed an empty symbol in their rhythm, they used that symbol of zero, the S symbol, called the Avagraha. And, and then similarly now in music, when we notate music, if we have a rest in when we're playing music, we use that symbol that Bainani introduced called the Lopa, the Avagraha. And so from philosophy, the zero as a concept moved to zero as a symbol in poetry and linguistics. And so this is all before zero came into mathematics, but this was in the air in Indian philosophy and linguistics and poetry, the idea of zero. And it was only in about the year then 300 that mathematicians started to think, oh, well, we should also have a symbol for nothingness. And already we see in a, a manuscript known as the Bakshali manuscript, the first time that we see the Indian numerals as we write them today, zero and one through nine, appearing just as we use them today in the year about 300 in the Bakshali manuscript. And around that time, because the zero was in the air in literature and philosophy, uh, zero as a number became adopted in the Indian subcontinent uh, very quickly, uh, even in the public consciousness. So for example, 
There's this uh, great novel written in the fourth century uh, called Vasavdatta, written by Subandhu, uh, which is full of similes and metaphors about various objects that come across in the human experience. And there's one scene where they're looking up at the night sky. And at that time, the zero, the mathematical zero, when we, they wrote the number zero through nine, zero was written as a dot. It wasn't written as a circle, it was written as a dot. Because zero was still just a placeholder, it wasn't considered a number in its own right. And so it was written just as a dot. And so in Vasavdatta, when they're looking at the night sky, uh, it's described as zero dots scattered across the sky. <laughs> And this is, this is a novel meant for the general public, and yet in it is, is, is being written, people are seeing mathematics in the sky, zero dots scattered across the sky. Uh, so already in the public consciousness, people are starting to use the numbers zero through nine to write numbers in around the year 400. Uh, but it wasn't until Aryabhata in around the year 499 where Aryabhata started to do computations with the numbers 0 through 9. All the astronomical calculations were simplified by using the numbers 0 through 9 to write all numerals in the way that we now learn to compute with them today. Uh, so by around 499, with Aryabhata's work, uh, the numbers were now being used for computation, uh, including the number 0. But still, 0 was not considered a number on its own. It was just a placeholder that we need to write the numerals uh, that, uh, in the Indian number system. But it was with the work of Brahmagupta in the year 628, where zero was written about as if it's just a number like any other. To Brahmagupta, it was very important that zero be appreciated, not just a placeholder, but as a number in itself. And so Brahmagupta writes these elaborate rules about zero plus any number is that number itself. Zero times any number is zero. All the arithmetic operations that we now do with numbers, he explained, you can do with zero as well. Zero is a number like any other. And that's where in human history is with Brahmagupta that zero became a number just like any other number, not just a placeholder, but a number in its own right. That's the year 628 uh, in India. The zero was then, was then uh, tra traveled to the Arab world uh, works of Al-Khrizmi and Al-Kindi described the method of calculation with the Hindu numerals, is what they call it. That, that's what, uh, what Al-Khrizmi's book was called. And it was through Al-Khrizmi's great work, building on the Hindu number system that, uh, that he wrote about, that was then transferred to Europe. Uh, and in Europe, these numbers reached 0 through 9, reached uh, in around the year 1100. But it's kind of amazing, just to appreciate how not obvious it was that these numbers are so useful. It took several hundred years for Europe to adopt the numbers, and they were still using Roman numerals for, for a few hundred more years. Now you can imagine if you've used Roman numerals before, just so you can appreciate, because we just learned this in school, but we don't learn to appreciate how important these number, the way we write numerals are today, uh, how important it really is. Uh, when people used Roman numerals, <laughs> to try to compute. Imagine trying to compute with Roman numerals. Very, very difficult. Also, Roman numerals, uh, each time you go to a higher number, you have to introduce a new symbol. What was amazing about the Indian number system is that just with the numbers 0 through 9, the numerals 0 through 9, you can write any number, however large or however small. And that's a very non-obvious thing, because the most obvious way to write numbers is to keep introducing a new symbol for higher and higher numbers. It's a very non-obvious concept that once you introduce zero, you only need 10 symbols to write any number you want, however large it is. And, and even just to appreciate that took several hundred years in Europe. And in fact, in, uh, in Florence in the year 1299, when more and more scientists and merchants were starting to take up the Indian numeral system because of, of the ease of computation with them, they were banned <laughs> by, the, uh, by the Florence government. Uh, because it was thought that maybe they come from Satan, they're coming from the Arab world. It has to be unholy. We have to stick with the Roman numerals. And so there was a law passed in Florence in 1299, 200 years after the Indian numerals entered Europe, to ban them, that we shouldn't be using these. <laughs> and it, it wasn't until the Renaissance where it just became impossible 
to live without the Indian numerals if you want to do computations and make great scientific discoveries. And only about the Renaissance, it was adapted in Europe uh, for, for use in, in both trade and science. And once that happens, the rest is history. Uh, great scientific achievements happened in the Renaissance in Europe, but the Indian numerals were the basis for a lot of that work. Uh, since they learned it from the Arabs, uh, the Europeans mistakenly called it the Arabic numerals, whereas the Arabs, of course, called the numbers Hindusa, the Hindu numerals. Uh, and now many times in India you see that we'll, over here we'll still call it the Arabic numerals, <laughs> because they went from here to Arabia and then the Europeans call it the Arabic numerals, and now we copy Europe and so we call them the Arabic numerals. <laughs> uh, but if you look at the history, of course, they originated in India, they got developed further um, in, in the Arab world, and made its way to Europe, and now after the European Renaissance, they're used worldwide. Uh, so that's, the, that's, in short, the history of the zero <laughs> and how they used in our everyday technology. And it's really hard to imagine how our world would have developed if we didn't have that invention. Every piece of technology now, the binary system that computers use um, to cell phones, to all technology, really uses the zero so foundational. Something we don't think about, but it it really allowed us uh, to move mathematics and science forward like almost maybe no other invention, I would say. So I like to tell that story because what's amazing about that story is not just, well, zero is an incredible invention, but how it came about. It started in philosophy, right? It made its way to linguistics, then poetry, then music, and then to astronomy with Aryabhata, and then finally to mathematics, and then to computer science and technology. That's the... That's the the lineage of the zero. And that's what really shows the importance of multidisciplinary education. <laughs> if, if anything, that, that story that teaches that. <laughs> so the idea that you can really borrow, you can, take, you can borrow concepts from one discipline and develop them in another discipline is just one of the key, just one of the key important uh, methods by which innovations are made. And that lesson is still important today. Uh, one thing we wrote in the National Education Policy is, is the story of Steve Jobs. So Steve Jobs was always complimented on how he transformed computing by marrying top-notch aesthetics with top-notch technology to, to make computing really accessible to the general person. And when he was asked you know, how the Macintosh computer that, uh, that his company made revolutionized computing, he said, I think part of what made the Macintosh great was that the people working on it were musicians and poets and artists and zoologists and historians who also happened to be the greatest computer scientists in the world. <laughs> so this idea of having a multidisciplinary background and being able to draw ideas from aesthetics and science uh, in and art to work on whatever you're, whatever you're trying to propel forward, uh, that's still applicable today and some of the best companies make sure to hire multidisciplinary teams and multidisciplinary people. And some of the greatest inventors also in the modern day are those that had a multidisciplinary education, the kind that Chanakya University is trying to achieve. Um, so that story of Zero and the story of Apple and all these multidisciplinary stories, we need more such stories. We need more such homegrown stories in India. It's time to move our higher education system in that direction again. Uh, like it was in the ancient times in, uh, in Nalanda and now they are in the modern times at the greatest universities in the world, Tarnaka University. I compliment them for, for moving forward on, on the recommendations of the national education policy. May it be a model for, for future uh, new institutions and, and the institutions that are already there in India today. May it be a model uh, to move towards that type of holistic multidisciplinary education. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you so much.